Well, hello again. It's been a few days since I've made a video. And uh, I've got a note here. I will get to Asylum State at some point, but we're not quite ready yet, I don't think. One thing I wanted to go over today that uh, hit me was, I don't think most people understand um, in, the, in, the, in this book, this book from beginning to end, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever, repeats the gospel message over and over and over again. It is part of the Torah. The gospel message is the fundamental overview of the Torah law and the plan, the will, the way of Yahweh. So um, I've got this open because I want this page. Um, and I've got several books marked here. We're going to go through this. But here's an overview. And we'll kind of come through each step uh, individually and I'll explain each one. Because the problem is, is what, what we see um, here. I'll, I'll do the mistakes real quick. Christians, Christians and Jews. Um, <clears throat> I should say that in this law, there is, let me go to, we'll pull out this other Bible here and we'll let me go pull that up real quick. I think it's... Uh, we're looking at Deuteronomy 12, 4, 4, Deuteronomy 4, 12, 4, 12, I think, yeah, uh, uh, oh, no, 4, 2, not 12, 2, I was in there, you see how my brain works sometimes, okay, so I'm going to read these first couple of verses here. This is Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which Yahweh, uh, your God of your fathers, giveth you. Ye shall not add, this is the important part, ye shall not add unto the word of this book, the Torah, the, the law, which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you. Okay, so we are forbidden to add to this law or take away from this law. Now think about what <laughs> these two houses of Israel, once they divided and had a civil war and they were both scattered, uh, the first was this whore Israel, which Yahweh even gave her a bill of divorce in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3, I think, verse 8. Now Judah the southern kingdom, you got this northern kingdom of Israel, which was ten tribes, the southern kingdom of Judah, which was kind of like three tribes, even though there was probably a little spattering of all the tribes, and there was probably some Judah up here in the Israel too, because they were, you know, at one time they were one nation, and they were moving back and forth and all this stuff under one. Okay, so now, which one of these in Israel was scattered and became the Gentiles mixed with all the Gentiles and became Gentiles and pagans and started worshiping all this stuff and kind of abandoned this law, even though some of this law stuck with them as their custom and usage. And we see resurgence of that law as they migrated all over the earth. Judah also went into captivity, but she wasn't given a bill of divorce. She went into Babylon and then in 70 AD and from 70 AD up until 48 AD, she was always a vassal under other 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 uh, Gentile uh, nation states and kings okay so both of these two are whores that biblically both Israel and Judah are whores now the one whore wasn't given a bill of divorce she adds to the law all the time Judah violates this statute except for except for the sect of 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 uh, Jews called Kerarite. Kerarite Jews only keep the Torah. They don't follow the Talmud and the oral traditions of the rabbis. Okay? So now Judah, though, Judah, though, is adding all kinds of stuff to this law. And this is why the Messiah 
uh, when he was here in his first advent, was railing against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin of Judea, the religious ruling elite, because they were doing all of this. They were violating this. And he was trying to he was trying to show the people the correct way to keep the Torah by getting rid of everything that they had added to it in their error and in their methodology of trying to control people and regulate control people. And that's what happens over time. We see the same thing happen here in the United States. We started off with very few laws, a lot of freedom, and over time our rulers that we elected, they just kept adding laws and adding laws and more regulations, and we kept contracting and contracting and contracting and now we've added all kinds of laws on top of, I mean, we're, we're in the millions and millions of laws in the United States uh, that have been added to the Constitution. And most of that has been added by contract, not by constitutional amendment, giving Congress more power, uh, or state co uh, constitution amendments, giving the state more power. It's been done by consent through contract and offers, Okay. So, and this is basically what the Pharisees did. Hey, follow me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you which shoe to put on first. I'm going to tell you how to wash your hands. I'm going to tell you how to do all kinds of silly things that are not part of it. So, the Messiah was railing against them. But then, what did this whore Israel do? She went the opposite way. Remember, it says, don't add to or take away from this law. What did this whore Israel do? Israel is so fond, all these Gentile pagans out here that call themselves Christians or whatever, they are so fond of their own civil law and their gods of the world that they love. I mean, Christians love Uncle Sam. I mean, they just love their civil law gods. Um, <clears throat> and they love that law. They hate this law, so what have they done with this law? They've taken away from it. They, they've actually gone so far as to say, well, it was annulled. <laughs> it was annulled. It was nailed to the cross, some of them. So, I mean, it's just, it's these two whores that are doing the exact opposite. They're sisters. But one of them's adding to this law all the time through Talmudic, rabbinical talk and note and, and ma'asim and, and all that stuff. And the Christians just say, nah, this has been done away with. I can go do whatever I want. Okay, so now let's look at the, what this real gospel is that both of these whores should be following. Because this gospel repeats in this book over and over and over again, Okay. From the very beginning. All right. So it starts in faith. But here's what the Christians do. I'll show you real quick. They skip all this stuff and go down here to number six. They just remove, because they're taken away from it, they're removing everything out of here. And they go faith to salvation. And then they think that salvation uh, brings blessings. So they cut that one out too. So that's what Christians do. Christians just take this one. Number one, number six, and they, uh, they'll they do a little number five, too, because that doesn't, and then blessings, okay? Now, what do the Jews do? The Jews skip that one. I mean, they have faith, but as far as their practical application goes, they they take, they start here. This is where they start. They start down here with obedience. And then they say that obedience, they kind of work backwards. They think that obedience is what brings self, you know, redemption and salvation. So you can see, and then all this, and because they're obedient, they're already faithful and righteous and just, and they do their sacrifices. But this is where the Jews start here at number seven. The Christians start at the right place. The Christians start up here at faith. But they have no idea what faith is. They have a blind faith. They don't know what faith means. Why? Because they they cut out the first half of the book. So they have nothing to, they have no legal definition for what the Bible says faith means under God. And, and what faith means under God is the same it means for any God. It means allegiance, fidelity, trust, loyalty, fealty, service. I'm going to prove that to you. Okay, so let's start off here. We've got faith. That's where we start this journey of the gospel. All right, so let's go here into Black's Law Dictionary. Allegiance. Obligation of fidelity and obedience. Ooh, what? 
to government in consideration for protection that government gives. Now, this applies to civil government, but does this also apply to the kingdom government? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, keep going here. This is still Black's Law Dictionary. Faith, confidence, credit, reliance. Thus, an act may be said to be done on the faith of certain representations. Belief, credence, trust. Thus, the consideration, or sorry, thus the Constitution provides that the full faith and credit shall be given the judgments of each state in the courts of the, of the others. You see that? Full faith and credit. The, 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 in, the, in the Constitution between these states. So each state has faith and belief and credence in the other about their laws. Okay? Faithful, honest, loyal, trustworthy, reliable, allegiant, conscientious. Fealty. In feudal law, fidelity, allegiance to the feudal lord. What's lord? Master. Do you call this king your lord in, the, in this kingdom? Of course you do. Okay. Bound to be faithful and true to his lord. Obedience and service. Faithful and loyal. What is due from every subject to his prince, the other special and required of such only as in respect of their fee are tied by this oath to their landlords. Okay, so um, does God give you land? Does he give you an allodial tile to it? But is there a fee involved? Do you have to give a tenth? Uh-huh. Yeah. See, we want, we want to usurp God, like I've said before in other videos. E pluribus unum, out of the many, we are the one. We're usurping, we're the adversary. That's what the word Satan means. Satan just means adversary. We're the adversary to God creating all these kingdoms and governments and laws that disobey this law. Okay? Keep going. Fetus, Latin, faith, honesty, confidence, trust, veracity, honor, Occurring in the phases, bona fides, bona fides, good faith, mala fides, bad faith. Now, <clears throat> I was going to look, you know, in the law dictionary, if you go to trust, you're going to get all about actual trust, like, you know, constructive trust, express trust, you know, guarantee trust, all that stuff. So, but... They have trust this in the old European law, trust, faith, confidence, fidelity. Okay? So you're starting to get this picture of what faith is. Yeah, we'll do a couple more here. Allegiance. And that's this is from an earlier blacks, but it's basically the same. Allegiance. The obligation of fidelity and obedience which the individual owes to the government under which he lives or to, to his sovereign in return for the protection he receives. What's the protections? The blessings. Okay. Allegiance is, as it were, the essence of the law. It is the bond of faith. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto Yahavah, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Genesis 14, 22. Abraham knew that often the gratuity proceeds the subjection. Ooh, subjection draws to it protection, protection, subjection. What God protects you. 
Have you pledged allegiance to a foreign and alien God and you're expecting protections and benefits and subsidies and immunities and franchises and pensions and bounties and entitlements and bailouts and protections? See, you weren't as faithful as Abraham. When the king of Sodom offered Abraham the spoils of the city, Abraham refused to take even a thread. Are you going to take the bailout check? Abraham proclaimed his subjection and trust in Yahavah, his God, and not in man or in man's city-states. This choice, by its nature, builds character. After these things, the word of Yahavah came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Because what Abraham trusted in, put his faith, his allegiance, his fidelity, his fealty in, which was Yahavah, now Yahavah comes and says, Look, dude, for your loyalty, for your faith, I am your shield. I'm your protector. I'm your provider. I'm the one who's going to, will, will provide the blessings of everything to you. Abraham trusted in God's rewards and benefits. Oh, he had faith in God's protection for this faith and the actions Abraham took by that faith, he received a promise and the new name Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. What? What? The heathen. That's everybody on earth. And the scripture foreseeing. When, where was this at? It's not in the New Testament. This was back in the Old Testament. Remember, the gospel is in the Old Testament. It's just restated in the New Testament. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. What? Preached before the gospel unto Abraham. You mean God was preaching the gospel message to Abraham? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's not, it, he changes not. He is, Yahavah is the epitome of stare decisis. Once settled, always settled. He said clearly, I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Abraham, in thee shall all nations be blessed. What's he talking about here? What Abraham chose to do. Remember, when she, the Bible says that when you follow Abraham, like Noah, like all these righteous men that kept this gospel, when you follow this way, you're going to be grafted in. You're going to be naturalized into this kingdom because you're keeping this law. You have obedience, fidelity, faith, trust, loyalty, fealty to this God not to other gods. So when you do that, regardless, because this book says, you know, there's one law for both the, the native born and the, the foreigner or stranger who sojourns gets grafted in with you. There's just, just like here in the United States, if you, if, if immigrants come from all other nations around the world and they come to the United States and they're naturalized and they're here, is there just one law for every foreigner that's living here and for the Native Americans? And I, I'm not talking about, you know, Native Americans, meaning everybody that's born here, regardless of your skin color. All right? One law. The Constitution. The laws of the state, the, the civil laws of the state of the United States. That's your law, regardless of whether you're a foreigner and that's everywhere. Go to Germany and try to keep Swedish law while you're a native of Germany or in a or a naturalized citizen of Germany. No, I'm keeping the uh, Swedish law here. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And I'll tell you, people are not real bright. Okay, let's move on. So we got faith. All right. So from faith, from this allegiance, this feel fidelity, this trust, this loyalty, 
moves to righteousness. Righteousness. Let's see what I got here. Oh, yeah. Here we go. We got a bunch of them. I just put into a Bible search, faith and righteousness. Romans 117. <laughs> For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just, the right, the righteous, the just shall live by faith. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. What? Okay. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. What sin? The violation of the law. Do you want a redeemer to pay the fine for, for the fact that you broke a law that carries a death penalty? Now, not every law is in the Bible carries a death penalty. We, in our sin, we have broken every law. And that several of them bear the death penalty. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We can, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. You'll see righteousness of faith, faith and righteousness. Da, 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 Here's a good one. Galatians 5.5. 5. For though the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And Hebrews, the chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is nothing but the faith and righteousness chapter. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear. So here, we could say by fidelity, by trust, by allegiance, by fealty, Trusting in God, because being warned of God, God warned him, said, hey, no, be careful. There's, uh, you know, I'm getting ready to do something here because there's all this wickedness in the world. So Noah trusted what God said, trusted the word of God. The, the thing's not seen yet. It hadn't started raining yet. There was no sirens going off saying the dam had broke. <laughs> Mood with fear, awe, reverence. That's not fear like <laughs> cowering. This is this fear here is awe, reverence. Like when you know, when you see something uh, that is just makes you feel so small. You know, you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Most people look at the Grand Canyon and go have a little fear there. That awe, that reverence. You know, when you look up into the heavens, you tend to have a little fear, a little awe and reverence for just the, the vast expanse of the heavens, the, the interstellar space. So what, what was he moved to do? Prepared an ark. And became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Okay. But through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness. Faith verse brings righteousness okay so as we move through the gospel message here you're going to see that faith as we start discovering what this when we start reading from the beginning of the book not from the end of the book when we start reading this from the beginning we're going to realize that faith this fidelity if you start trusting in god you're going to notice that it leads you to see and understand righteousness well, from there, that's going to lead us. If we keep reading this book, we're going to we're going to realize that righteousness leads us to see justice. How can you have righteousness if you don't have justice? If you don't do what? See, just, just, right. And it said righteousness and justice kiss. They absolutely do. You can't have righteousness without justice and you can't have justice real justice without righteousness is that what you're getting in your courts today in these civil law courts are you getting justice why not uh, you lack righteousness all these judges all these attorneys all these plaintiffs all these defendants lack righteousness oh they have self-righteousness <laughs> <laughs> don't 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 get too far off. Self righteousness is not righteousness. Righteousness is measured by the by this book. 
by this law. Righteousness is measured by the word of God. Righteousness is measured by, by God, the God, the creator. And it's his righteousness that we are trying to attain through our faith, through this trust, our fealty, our service, our fidelity and our allegiance and loyalty to this God. We're trying to achieve his righteousness for, for where was it here? Righteousness, which is by faith. Okay. So now justice. Okay, well, if we if we now get to understand justice by studying this book, we're going to come to what we call sacrifice. And this is what people, oh my God, sacrifice, oh, that's awful. No, it's just payment. Sacrifice is just payment. Value for value. Value for your value. This is why you get the I for I. Life for life sort of thing. You know, wound for wound, stripe for stripe, porch for porch, car for car, you know, horse for horse, whatever. Payment, value for value. That's a sacrifice. So let me ask you something. Uh, for anyone who's ever paid a penalty, a fine for violating the law, let's say because you're, let's say you're, you have your faith in in the state of whatever, wherever you reside, you have your faith, your allegiance to the United States and the state of what, whatever. So you're trying to be righteous to that law, to that God. So you're being righteous and you're. You're going down and getting a driver's license to be righteous, to keep, you know, to, to, you know, your faith moves you to be righteous. Okay, so now you have this contract because you're driving the state's car on the state's highways. You think you own it, but you really don't. Go watch those videos in this series. You don't really own any of that property. You have a, an equitable interest in the property, but you don't have a low deal title to it. The state has a superior title because you never paid for it. You're using Federal Reserve Bank credit to buy stuff. That's You can't own stuff that way. Okay, so you're being righteous. You get a driver's license. Now you're out tooling around in the state's car on the state's road, and you violate your contract. The terms and conditions of the contract are the motor vehicle code. So you get caught for speeding. You're doing, you know, 75 and a 55. What does justice demand? What is the what is the penal clause, the ordinance? The, the officer gives you a ticket. So do you have to pay a sacrifice? Do you have to make a payment for the violation of the law to make things just, just and right? because you're in breach of contract. Do you have to make that just and right again? How do you do that? Through payment. What'd you pay? Oh, I don't know. If you're doing 20 miles over the speed limit, what do you think you're gonna pay? 200 bucks? Value for value. Now let me give you an example of bad, that's, that's totally a violation of the Torah because in the Torah it's value for value. Now in the Torah there are some examples of penal damages, you know, punitive damages. I shouldn't say penal, it's punitive. They're, they're trying to punish the criminal so that he wakes up and repents. So like, you know, if you stole a car, um, but you get your car back, there's, there's, um, there's really no penalty, you know. The, the thief, you slap him on the hand, and, but he should give you gas money, and if he caused any damage to the car, you know, maybe he washes it or cleans it, vacuums it out, or you know, pays for the scratch he got on the door. But if he parted your car out, now he's got to give you uh, more than one car. He's got to give you back your car, but then he's got to give you more than cars because he, he did that. It wasn't just a joy ride. It wasn't some stupid prank. It was somebody deliberately stealing your property to make money and do something uh, malicious with it. So now the punitive um, damages come in and he's got to give you back more than just your car. 
So, but an example of way out of whack punitive damages where you don't really see this value for value is like the lady that got burnt by the hot coffee at McDonald's in her in the drive through How how many, you know, McDonald's, in order to be just and right in their sacrifice to, to make that lady shalom or whole and complete again, just needed to pay for her medical bills to get her healed. And then whatever time, if she had to be out of work because of those burns on her leg, then they needed to pay for compensation for her time out of work. That's it. So that might have been a few few thousand dollars. But what'd she get? Uh, I think she got several hundred thousand dollars. That's not value for value. That's when corruption starts creeping into your justice system. Okay. All right, so now the sacrifice, let's see what let's see what I got up here now. Let me close this one. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I messed that up. Oh well, we'll just go on. Uh, like I said, I do these on the fly, so I made a mistake there. Closed the whole thing, and I just wanted to close that one tab. Anyway, I'm not very technically savvy. All right, so from sacrifice, now we see we need redemption. Why? Because some of the laws that we violated in this law that applies to every human being on earth, regardless of what we believe, is we've committed some some capital offenses that require life. What's the payment? Your life. Now it's appointed for every man to die once, but we're all going to be resurrected to stand trial. You cannot be judged you cannot be judged in this law without due process of this law. And that means you're going to stand trial and you're going to be considered innocent until proven guilty. But it's going to be pretty easy for an omnipotent, omniscient being to, to know that you're guilty. And who is it that's standing there making the accusations? This is the one, this is that angel or messenger of God, this, this servant of God that we call Lucifer. That's who we call Satan, the adversary. That's, you know, he's the one prosecuting this case against you. Now, who's your defense attorney? Most people are going to go in there uh, sui juris, pro se. They're not going to have an advocate, a redeemer. Uh oh. So then you're going to be found guilty. And then at this trial, you'll be, you, you know, you're going to die what they call the second death. And that's a permanent death now. It's not a hell. This is what, you know, that, that whole hell thing. That's, that's nonsense. You're not going to burn to hell forever. You're going to be burned up and gone in an instant. Think more like uh, the lake of fire as being like uh, you, you right now being thrown into a, a pool of lava. How long do you think you're going to survive? A couple of seconds. And what's going to be left of you? Are there going to be any bones? Are there going to, is there going to be any flesh? Is there going to be any sinew if you get thrown into a lake of fire, into a lake of lava? Of course not. Nothing. There's nothing left of you. So that's the second death. It's pretty quick. It's probably very pain, you know, probably not a lot of pain. There's probably some, but it's going to be quick. So now, how do, you, how do you avoid paying this sentence, this life penalty of permanent death? Well, you need a redeemer. And that's the next step. So from sacrifice, once we see the need for sacrifice, which sacrifice doesn't go away. You're paying sacrifice right now in this alternative system that you're contracted into. You just don't call it sacrifice. You call it, you call it fines, fees, and penalties for violating the law. And your judges, they, the, these priests are sitting in your courthouses, your temples, and they're wearing robes, and they sit up on an altar above you, and they bring down the judgment of what you've got to pay for the violation of the law in order to ensure that what's just and right within that civil law system. So you're doing the exact same things. Now, you're just not, you're just not using you know, cattle and sheep as money. You're using little pieces of paper and checks, right? Because, see, that's what this book says. You know, when you, when you bring these sacrifice, some of these sacrifices, 
into the temple where, you know, if this is a sin sacrifice and some of the other types of sacrifices that you have to give, uh, you know, it, tell, it details what part of this animal do the priests get to keep, right? You're going into your court, your temple building, and you're paying your sacrifice with uh, a check or a credit card when you speed or, you know, get caught and found guilty of doing something that you shouldn't have been doing. So you pay the fine, and now that fine goes into, and, and the judge, the priests get paid in a paycheck instead of cutting off, you know, the rump roast and taking the rump roast home and feeding their family with the rump roast off of this piece, uh, off of this animal that you brought in to sacrifice. You see how that works? You're doing the same thing, <laughs> you know. Okay, so now from this sacrifice, because you're guilty and you've committed a, 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 a crime that requires the death penalty, um, or any of these other crimes, if you can't afford to pay the penalty, what do you need? You need, you need a redeemer. You need somebody to come in there. The court doesn't care. Let's go back to your speeding ticket example. Do you think the court cares that you're the one that pays the fine? Or could I pay, if you didn't have the money, could you come to me and say, you know, hey, bud, um, I'll pay you back. Uh, could you pay this fine for me right now so I can get out of this courthouse, out of this temple? Well, then you're asking me to be your redeemer. And you want me to redeem you. What does redemption mean? Ransom. What's the ransom? Ransom is the payment. The redemption is the payment. Now, I have this, I keep this up here as a reminder every day. This is from 1 Corinthians 6.20. For ye are bought, redeemed, ransomed, with a price. Sacrifice, payment, value for value, a price. What's the price? I don't know. Depends on what the law says. What'd you do? Well, could be your life. For ye are bought, redeemed, ransomed, with a price. Great value. What's the price that was paid for your life? His life. He had to lay down his life, life for life. The law had to be fulfilled. Therefore glorify Yahavah in your body, physical, and in your spirit, character, which are Yahavah's. So once you call on, if once you have faith, let's go back here now. Once you have faith, not only in the, the, you know, the Messiah is the word. He's the living word. He's the word made flesh. He can't break this law because it's his law. He wrote it. And he's not going to annul it because if he annuls it, he annuls himself. And he doesn't add to it. He doesn't dress up and add a bunch of garments to himself. He doesn't put on 180 pounds to carry around a Talmudic, you know, nonsense. And he doesn't starve himself to skin and bones like the Christian. Oh, you know, let's just let's just chop this up and get rid of it and bury it. <laughs> he's the word made flesh. So if you have this faith, you'll understand that he's throughout this entire book. He was with the father from the beginning. He's the one at Mount Sinai. He's the one doing this. He's the one with Joshua before they take, when Joshua has to take off his shoes, when Moses has to take off his sandals. He's the one throughout this entire book. When Abraham's sitting there asking him questions about, you know, are you going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there's one righteous? You know, that's the Messiah. <laughs> so this faith, he's, he's throughout this whole book. He's everywhere throughout it. Okay, so are you going to trust in this Messiah who is sent by the Father to redeem you? To pay the ransom, to make the payment, the price, the value for value, life for life. He gave his life. Now, are you going to believe faith, belief, allegiance, fidelity, trust, trust in that sacrifice, have loyalty and believe and know that that was done for you and all of us. So this is the part that Christians get right. 
okay? But they've skipped all this. They think this has been done away with. No, it hasn't. It's still there. It's still there. You got to keep this law. Now, what, what, if you have this blood of the lamb on you, now this is where it gets tricky because there's a law in here. There's a difference between sinning by mistake and sinning willfully. Willful sin, willful sin can't, is not forgiven. That's the part that we've got to really be careful of. Now, it's different if you just don't know. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of things that we do that we don't know. And there's probably a lot of things we think are sin that aren't sin. And then there's things that, that are sin that we don't think are sin. So we're violating those laws. And we're keeping others because of our own twisting of this word. Because we don't understand what all these laws are saying in truth. But that's what the that's what the Messiah did in the what we see in the New Testament is he comes back and he actually lives it out. And you're going to find a reference in the New Testament with the Messiah's advent. You will find every Torah law restated. Now, how does he do that? He doesn't always do it by quoting, but he quotes a lot of stuff from the Torah. But he also does it by acts. And by implication, I'll give you an example. Did the did the Messiah wear zitzit, which is a commandment in Numbers after the after the guy was found picking up sticks on the Sabbath day? God said, "I gotta keep it. I gotta do stuff here to get you to stop breaking my law." So he adds this zitzit statue, which is the fringes on your garments, for you to see. Kind of like wearing a rubber band on your wrist or on your fingers to help you to remind you to do something. So that's what those zitzits are. And he told you to put a blue thread in them that represents the Messiah. Okay. And when you see those zitzits, those are to be like the rubber band on your finger to get you to remember that you got to keep this law because you keep breaking it. So does the Messiah actually tell the people in the New Testament to wear zitzis? No. It's done by implication when he's walking through the streets and a woman reaches out and grabs his zitzi and is healed. So is the Messiah, by implication, wearing the zitzis because the woman grabbed the zitzis on his garment? Absolutely. So is the Messiah keeping the zitzi rule? Yes, he can't break any law because it, he is the law. He's the one, he's the author of it. He's, he's the one that lives it out perfectly. And that's why he comes and he shows us how to do it without the adding and subtracting. Here's what my pure intent is. Follow me and do this and you will live. You're starting to see this. He's showing us how to keep the law righteously according to the pure intent of the law, not what's been added to it, not what's been taken away from it. Okay, so, so once this has been paid, now that we, we see salvation. Now, this is an easy one to see in the Exodus out of Egypt. This occurred... On the, on the first day of unleavened bread. You could call this uh, salvation or redemption day. Okay, because remember that last plague in Egypt was this Passover lamb. Who did that represent? Us Messiah. Where did they put the blood? Where did they put the payment? Life for life, blood for blood. They put the 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 they painted the blood with hyssop, uh, which is an anticoagulant, by the way. Uh, that's why they were using hyssop uh, to paint the doorposts and the lintel of the door, because that house represents your temple, your body. So, in order to keep everybody inside safe, specifically the firstborn, uh, that price had to be paid. So they trusted their faith in Yahuwah's instructions 
law to kill the to kill a perfect lamb and put the blood on the door was their redemption. This was redemption day. That's why it's an annual holy day. One week later, they're at the Red Sea. One week later, they're at the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army pushing down on them. How are they saved? Could they save themselves, or did they need a higher power to save them from certain death at the hand of Pharaoh's army? They didn't have any weapons. Pharaoh's taken out his best chariots, his best soldiers. They're all armed to the hilt. This would have been like shooting fish in a barrel. So this superior God had to save them. So from redemption, they get salvation. When does this salvation come? When you find out that you've got eternal life. When is that? Well, that doesn't happen yet. You believe, you trust, you have faith through all of this that you will be saved in that day. What day? The day you stand trial. I have the blood of the Lamb on me. So now this is why the last day during the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a holy day that you take the day off. It's salvation day. It's when they were saved by God parting the Red Sea and they threw a miracle, miracle that they couldn't do. They walked through and were saved. Okay, so now remember all of this, you know, all of this we learn from the law, but in this Exodus story, this came first, this came first, then they get to the mountain, and then the law was given. See, they this whole Exodus story follows this same gospel message. They had to have faith first. What was going on in, in, with all these plagues? The fulfillment of righteousness and justice. There was a sacrifice, the Passover lamb. They were redeemed. They had salvation. And now they're given the law, and what do you do when you're given a law by the one who redeemed you and saved you? You obey. What are you going to obey? The law. The Torah. This is now your God. This is your sovereign. This is who you are seeking, like Abraham, who sought protection and blessings. And then obedience brings, brings blessings. Not faith. Faith doesn't bring blessings. Redemption doesn't bring blessings. Salvation doesn't bring blessings. Obedience is what brings blessings. How, how, how can I say that with such an em, 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 emphasis? Because it's in here. Now, it, that you won't find anywhere where it says obedience brings blessings. What it says are, gives you details of the blessings. Okay? So let's look at an example here. If I can get this to zoom in or focus. Guard my Sabbaths and reverence my set-apart place. I am Yahavah. If, see, these are all if-then statements when it comes to blessings and obedience. Or disobedience and curses. You know, bad stuff. If you walk in my laws and guard my commands and shall do them, then, if-then statement, I shall give you rain in its season, and the land shall yield its crops, and the trees of the field yield their fruit, and your threshing shall last till the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last till the time of the sowing, and you shall eat your bread until you have enough, and you shall dwell in your land safely. In America, are you dwelling safely? Is your food full of vitamins and minerals and, and all kinds of good stuff? Or are you eating empty calories through processed food and GMOs and hybridized seed and everything else that violates the agricultural laws of this book? And I shall give you peace in the land. Do you have peace in the land? At all levels? And you shall lie down and no one will make you afraid. And I shall clear the land of evil beasts and not let the sword go through your land. And how much crime is there? How much corruption is there in your government and at all levels and between people backstabbing each other? And you shall pursue your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. 
you, you, you know, the United States body politic has been fighting a bunch of ragtag uh, ragheads over in Afghanistan for how long? They're not falling. They're kicking your butt. That Taliban over there is kicking your butt. And five of you shall pursue a hundred, and a hundred of you shall pursue ten thousand, and your enemy shall fall by the sword before you. That's not happening. The last time that happened for the United States might have been World War II, but even a better example of this, you had superior numbers in World War II. The last time this actually came was Andrew Jackson. Go, go look up like the Battle of New Orleans. See what the odds were for Andrew Jackson and, and in those early battles against the England. That's when you were righteous and this fulf was fulfilled by Americans. When they were up against much greater and superior forces and few of them caused the English to scatter. And I shall turn you and make you fruitful and shall increase you and shall establish my covenant with you. You're not being fruitful. I mean, everybody's, you know, the, you're, you're barely, barely, barely keeping a, uh, a sustaining population growth by having one and a half kids. You're not being fruitful. And I shall establish my covenant with you. No, he hasn't established that with you. And you shall eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. And how do I know this too? Because he, he goes on and say, one of the blessings will be, I shall set my dwelling place in your midst. And my being, my essence, shall not reject you. And I shall make you walk, and I shall walk in your midst. And shall be your Elohim, and you shall be my people. Well, you're the people of Uncle Sam. And he's your Elohim. He's your mighty one. He's your sovereign, your lawgiver, and your judge. Okay, and then, but curses for disobedience. But if you do not obey, I will also do this to you. See, it's an if-then statement. So that's the gospel message. You put all these in order and you get down to where, oh, I get some good stuff. Sweet. And they're all listed in there. I mean, I just read you one. There's a bunch of them. Wasting diseases. You do all this. He says, one of the blessings is, I won't put any of the disease, the wasting diseases of Egypt on you. Huh. Do you know what a wasting disease is? Something that kills you slowly over time. Cancer, diabetes, lupus, uh, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, heart disease. You're nothing but riddled with wasting diseases. Why? Because... None of you do this. <laughs> I hate to be, I hate to yell at you, but you're not doing this. And then, but you're running around praying, you know, saying that he said in Isaiah, "Don't pray to me. <laughs> don't, don't, don't pray to me." Where, where is that? Let's just let's get to that real quick because that's pretty good. Isaiah, it's just right in the first chapter of Isaiah. Whoops, too far. Oh, let's see. Oh, you know what? Let me do it in this one. I think I've got it all marked up here. That's every year when I go through, I get a different Bible. So they're all noted up pretty bad. There we go. In order for me to learn more, I gotta keep marking, marking them up and up and up. As I study this law book, like you have to do. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken Yahavah. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot 
even to the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Now this is obviously allegory here. You're not running around, well, some of you probably are, but, you know, with some sort of venereal diseases and other things, you might have putrefying sores and things like that. And you may have wounds and bruises. I mean, if you got, you know, okay, unrighteous people that beat the hell out of you, you know, spouses that, spousal abuse. and They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. But what this means is they're not like void of people. It's desolate of the righteousness, desolate of this. Your cities are burned with fire. Mm. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. I just read that um, in this latest COVID bailout bill, this almost two trillion dollars. <laughs> I mean, how much of that is going to strangers overseas, foreign aid? Wow. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in the garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom. What? Except Yahavav hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. You mean there's a few of us out here keeping this? Yeah, there's a few of us. It's a remnant. Just like he said to Isaiah when Isaiah was down in that, that cave at Mount Sinai. And Isaiah's crying, am I the only one keeping this law? And Yahavah answers, no, Isaiah, I have kept 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. But all is Lord. Do these foreign and alien gods like the United States, state of Minnesota, state of California? Then he says it again here. Okay. A remnant. Now, do you want to be part of that remnant? You can. You got to repent. You got to turn around and start following all these steps here. Okay. Hear the word of Yahavah, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our Lord, ye people of Amora. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? How many things that are people doing today that they offer up and say, I'm doing this for Yahavah. I'm doing it to God. Are they given offerings, tithes and offerings in, in churches and different places? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. See, what happened is, even back then, they turned this all into ritual instead of what it was for. Remember, what is, what is all that sacrifice for? There's two types of sacrifice. I, we, didn't, we didn't go over that. But not every sacrifice is for payment. Some sacrifices are just, God wants you to come to his house. Think of that altar uh, out there in the yard. Think of the tabernacle as being God's house. And you're his kids. And he wants you to come over periodically and bring some food. And we're going to barbecue. Because when you read through most of the descriptions of the sacrifices, who eats them? Everybody. It's a big party. It's a barbecue. You ever been to a big barbecue where people bring food or any kind of potluck? Do you go empty-handed? If you get invited to somebody's barbecue, their cookout, do you go empty-handed or do you bring something? When you get invited, do you even say, hey, what can I bring? And they'll tell you. And do you not bring it? Do you just show up empty-handed? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of sacrifices in here that have nothing to do with this payment thing, but are part of the party. These are your free will offerings. These are, you know, peace offerings and things like that. Those are for the party. This is the aroma that God's smelling now. When you do this, these are not a vain sacrifice. 
But when it just becomes a vain ritual where you're just doing it for the sake of doing it, that'd be like going out to your barbecue, you know, instead of you eating the meat and the vegetables and everything else that you're barbecuing on that grill, you just burn them up and you dance around the grill and you oh, uh, uh, and you sing a song and you wave your hands and do stupid stuff and you just throw that stuff on there and you burn it up like it's a ritual. That's what it became. It became empty and vain. It lost its purpose for what it was actually for. Oops, where is it? When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this of your hand to tread my courts? What? He says it. You're doing all this in vain. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? You've lost the reason why you're doing this. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. Now, it's not when it's done for these righteous purposes, but it is when it's all done for vanity or to a foreign and alien God. <laughs> and that's what most people are doing. Most people are bringing their tithes and offerings, their taxes and their fines and their fees and their charitable giving to this God, this other God, not this God of the Bible. The new moons and the Sabbaths. The calling of assemblies, I can't, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Okay, so new moons, this means months. So your calendars and your holidays, the calling of your assemblies, because none of it is done according to the law of and the way of Yahavah. You're doing it according to this civil law. I cannot. It's an iniquity. I can't bear it anymore. You're doing all this sin. You're completely in, in into apostate stuff with these foreign and alien gods. Your new moons, your calendars, and your appointed feasts, your holy days, Easter, Christmas, New Year's, Halloween, 4th of July, Labor Day, you know, Memorial Day, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands... <laughs> Think of all those people in church waving their hands and then they put them together and they pray. I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Hey, uh, let me ask you something. How many people have you killed over the years in foreign wars as the United States carrying that flag? Huh? Huh? How many, how many people have died here in the United States? Just, well, I just read that uh, Governor Cuomo in New York killed 15,000 elderly. I hear Governor Whitmer in Michigan has killed a bunch of people young and old by putting them into these nursing homes with that plague. What does Yahuwah say to do? Wash you. What are you washing away? All this crap you're doing from the civil law. You got to get all that off of you. You got to get the Egypt out of the Israelite. Make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. What's evil? It's all the civil law stuff that you're doing. Everything that, everything that you're not doing that's in here your insurance, limited liability. This this law demands strict liability. You know, payment with this funny money. You know, keeping all these other holy, you know, these different holy days. You know, worshiping these other gods where you've pledged allegiance to these other gods. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. What judgment? You got to get back to this thing, right? Faith, righteousness, justice. Sacrifice, value for value. 
Redemption and salvation, obedience, blessings. You got to get back to this message here, kids. Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith Yahavah. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of Yahavah hath spoken it. And that message of distress and trouble is repeated over and over and over again, too. Remember, curses, bad stuff, struggle, oppression, corruption, lawlessness, war, famine, disease, blah, 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 for disobedience. It's your choice, kids. As Joshua said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. What? Faith, allegiance, fidelity, trust, loyalty fealty, service. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Who are you going to pledge your faith and allegiance to? Whose righteousness are you going to seek? What justice are you going to impose? From what law are you going to follow? Are you going to, are you going to judge fairly so that the sacrifice is value for value? Eye for eye? Tooth for tooth? Or are you going to have crap where you're going to need massive tort reform because you're giving a lady that had a couple of thousands worth of damage, you know, $100,000? Redemption, salvation, obedience brings blessings. And you aren't receiving the blessings right now. Why? You haven't done any of this. Not really. Read Isaiah 1. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember, this is not to be construed as legal advice. This is for education purposes only. And we'll see you the next time.